everyone in the service in oh shit. <laughs> everyone in the service industry has a story. Crazy customers, wild orders, and WTF moments. Do you want to start a tab? The podcast here to bring you those tales from behind the bar. My name's Carl, and I was just told my wine game is I don't even that was stupid. I don't even know what I was told anymore. I'm gonna start this all over. <laughs> we took a nap earlier and we just like woke up 40 minutes ago, so ugh. That was going to be my intro. Oh, well, it can still be an <laughs> intro. Everyone in the service industry has a story. Crazy customers, wild orders, and WTF moments. Do you want to start a tab? The podcast here to bring you those tales from behind the bar. My name's Carl, and my cleaning day is on a Monday. For the house. Oh, my name's Riley, and I just woke up from a nap. Yeah, not the bar. I don't clean the shop once I was a week. Like, I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and also, what are you talking about? You don't clean the house. I try. We cleaned the backyard today. No, we we took some things to the dump today. Yeah, we cleaned it. <laughs> <laughs> Anywho, so usually what we do on this little, lovely little podcast is read stories off the internet about the hospitality industry through the eyes of the guest or the employee. But today, for two weeks in a row, we are going to talk to a fellow bartender who competed in a drink competition, bartending competition that is world class. <laughs> <laughs> hey, John, welcome back, bud. How you doing today? Hey, you're doing well. Thanks for having me back. It's been been too long. Right, exactly. If you don't know who John is, he, well, you can tell people who you are. I don't want to speak for you. <laughs> oh, wow. Thanks. Uh, hey, my name is John Matir. I've been in the industry for... 14, 15 years now, it kind of all starts to run together. Mm -hmm. uh, I've worked in bars all over the country, but I'm currently the beverage director at TPC Sawgrass with the PGA Tour, doing cool beverage programs with golf tournaments. And uh, I also do some cocktail competitions on the side. You do. And if you want to, I don't even know what episode it was. It's been a while. But if you go back to the episode that you were on earlier, you kind of talk about more about your journey working at Death & Co. and working in Florida and Colorado and a fun little that was a fun episode to hear that yeah it's a fun little journey definitely a lot of uh risks taken along the way but we're in a good spot it feels good All right now you don't get well you can still take risks but now moving around just a bartender is probably not a big on your radar anymore since you have a new addition to the family right yeah i do i have a four-month-old kid uh so i don't really <laughs> plan on moving for quite some time <laughs> it'd be nice to plant roots and uh settle in a little bit yeah and what's nice about your new position is you're not you're doing nine to five right you're not doing the the four to two i know in the i never thought it was possible to have a nine to five in the hospitality industry <laughs> and have health care it's very strange <laughs> it's very unsettling uh but it does get easier to uh take it in every day right so very oh. grateful for that no absolutely yeah because you don't see insurance much in the hospitality industry unless it's a big company that has maybe like three or four locations um or they do like five million dollars a year or something crazy like that so but working for i mean i guess you is the sawgrass a corporate a corporate place or is it just like a private entity you know yeah absolutely uh so the pga tour owns a couple properties They're, they always have tpc tournament players club okay uh as basically the the title uh you can either be owned by the PGA Tour or rent to have TPC in the front of your club, which basically means you get all of our training protocols, you get all of our benefits of being part of the network and part of the PGA Tour, which is really, really fantastic. Sweet. So you are technically an employee of the PGA then, huh? Yeah, they sign my checks. Right. right <laughs> That's cool. Did you ever think in your little John life growing up you'd ever be working for the PGA? Not a chance. <laughs> Not a chance. I also never thought I'd be a bartender. So sure. let's be yeah. <laughs> let's be real. How how is your golf game now since you've been working there? Oh, about the same. Terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Something about a uh, bartending, you know, for the majority of my career till four in the morning, uh, doesn't lend itself to a seven or eight a.m. game of golf in no. Florida. <laughs> yeah, there's a couple of us in Cedar Rapids when we'd go and play, and just, we're just like, we're just here just to drink and kind of swing at a ball, you know, and ride in a golf cart. Yeah, right. <laughs> All that matters is you're having a good time. You're hanging out with friends, maybe, and you get some fresh air. Like that's. That's what it's about. It's about the stories you have along the way. It's Ex not necessarily how many balls you lose in the woods or the water. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So today what we're going to talk about is John. So we, last week we interviewed Billy and he competed in the U.S. You got it. You got it. Sound it out. USGA. 
So close. <laughs> USBGA. USB Bartenders Guild. USBG. USBG presents World Class, sponsored by Diageo. <laughs> yes. And so... We had a media training. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he competed, and Billy got in the top 30. And we did mention John's name a couple times in that, because you were fortunate enough to get in the top 10 this year, correct? I did. I somehow snuck my way in there. <laughs> they didn't. They just turned a blind eye and just ran in there. <laughs> yeah, but this, that was the wild card. This wasn't your first year competing, correct? No, this was actually my third year uh, doing the competition, but this was my first time uh, making it to the live part of the competition, which I think was really cool to experience. So um, we kind of talked with Billy. Everything's a learning experience, you know, right? Even everything in life is a learning experience. What did you take? I mean, I guess how was the first two years that you entered? Was it? Was this like your third straight year or did you kind of skip a couple of years or talk us through that? So this is this is my third straight year. Uh, so 2022 would have been the first year uh, applied, really had no idea what I was doing, but I saw so many really incredible people competing in the competition. And I was like, you know what, let's take a stab. I've kind of always viewed competitions as a way to learn and expand my skills and kind of grow a little bit. I was like, what better place to do it than with this one that so many other incredible people were doing? At the very mm -hmm. least, maybe I can just network with these people and learn a little bit. Right. Um, so 2022 made top 100, uh, didn't advance to the top 30, but got some really, really great feedback. Uh, because every time that you apply and submit any sort of like recipe, you get judges from around the country to actually respond to your recipes and how to learn and grow. So I took that, I applied again in 2023 and again, didn't make the top 30, but I did make top 100 again. <laughs> so that felt pretty good. Uh, and then this year, uh, was the first year I got to advance to the next step, taking the previous two years, you know, critiques from the judges and everything and kind of, you know, reaching out to some people that have done the competition in the past to like see how I could actually like get my application to the next step. And I got there, luckily. So that's awesome. So Billy was kind of explaining to us, and I guess I didn't realize this because I applied last year, I think because you had mentioned something to it, actually, when we talked last year. Um, but he goes, basically, the first part is all about how well you write your written statement up for it. I mean, obviously, you have to write, like, the cocktail has to look and sound like it would work. But is that true? Or, I mean, is that is that a piece of it? Or Yeah, it's definitely a piece of it. So every year, the challenge changes. So this year, it was your one signature drink that you would present at some sort of event, whether it's like a garden party, pool party, anything like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically, uh, you create your drink using Diageo's portfolio of spirits or non-alcoholic spirits like Seablip, uh, put those together and you have to tell a story about one, how your drink fits the event, how it's balanced for the event, how the people would receive this event, uh, and then how the flavors, you know, basically combine to accentuate the cocktail and you have 500 words to do it. <laughs> it doesn't seem like that's a lot of words to explain all of that. It is a lot of words to explain all of that. And you have to be very precise right. <laughs> because I mean, there are thousands of people that apply for this and you know, they have just as much knowledge, if not more than you. So you kind of have to be very tactful about how you're inserting brand knowledge alongside cocktail knowledge and alongside what the actual challenge is. Right. So, uh, so you got to the top 100 this year and then what did you do to, what was, I guess, what was your, uh, entry to get into the top 30 yeah so the challenge for the top 30 this year was to design a menu uh with four drinks basically uh around any sort of event possible it could be any event you wanted and i was like okay how do we how do we design a menu that catches people's attention is short and succinct and is an event that is memorable because I don't want everyone's going to do like a party, right. Mm -hmm. Or something like that. How do I catch the attention of the judge and be like, Oh, I haven't seen one like that before. Right. Um, so I kind of just looked at like what's going on in my life around me. My wife and I were planning a baby shower <laughs> for the kids. So I was like, let's design a menu for a baby shower. Oh, so that's I did awesome. a, <laughs> which was kind of dope. Uh, and I did a comic book superhero themed uh, menu. Right. So I had four drinks. It looked like a comic book. Uh, and I had non-alcoholic drinks. I had low ABV drinks. I had some full strength drinks. And it kind of hit the whole spectrum mm -hmm. because you're at a baby shower. Obviously, there's at least one person who isn't drinking. <laughs> right. Yeah. right. <laughs> so you need to have something for everybody. Right. Um. But also, like, it ties into this theme because a big thing about, you know, menu design, especially like these limited menus when you do pop-ups or anything like that, 
they need to also be part of the conversation piece. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, superhero nostalgia is everywhere right now. Right. Someone's going to pick up this comic book and everyone's going to have a story about a superhero. It doesn't matter what genre, right? Marvel, DC, who cares, right? Uh, But you're going to have a story about a superhero and everyone had a favorite one growing up. You can talk about that with the kid and it's basically a conversation starter while people were sharing these drinks at the party. And we only had 250 words to explain all of that. Oh, wow. So that was a journey. <laughs> what, uh, yeah, um, what did you kind of, do you remember what the pour you made or one or two that you really liked? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I did a non-alcoholic spritz because I love putting at least one spritz on a menu and it's kind of gets the party started with bubbles because everybody in a good mood. Uh, I did one, you know, dessert kind of style cocktail with like coffee and chocolate. Uh, I did a like banana old fashioned in there. Uh, and then I did like a cognac uh, sour with egg whites. There you go. So kind of kind of hitting the whole whole spectrum in there using, you know, four big brands. The dessert cocktail had tequila in it. So I kind of hit rum, bourbon, <laughs> you know, like kind of showing the knowledge that I had for the entire Diageo portfolio in there. But also like you would for a any menu for a bar or restaurant, you want to have something for everybody. Yeah. And this was really cool, too, because it it made you actually use your entire brain for the challenge. It wasn't just like, Hey, it's just four drinks thrown on a sheet of paper. Mm -hmm. You know, like I have to actually think about how my drinks are like done with intent to make sense within the context of the menu. Right. I think that's a part too. Like I know I struggled that the first couple of years when I created menus because I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. No one told me. You're not supposed to hear one. Yeah. (laughs) It's it's a learning curve. Well, yeah. It probably, I mean, I had no, I mean, back this was 13, 14 years ago. So no one's teaching me stuff. I just did things I thought, would be great on it but now we're we spend a lot of time curating our menus together and just seeing what will work what doesn't work or making or, sure we have a little bit of something for every taste mm-hmm. or not too much of this one type mm-hmm. too much flavor or something so yeah, it's, yeah and it's, they're not all like super nerdy bartenders cocktails mm-hmm. where <laughs> we're the only ones that are going to order the drinks it's not the average person <laughs> yeah <laughs> right. don't want it yeah because like you kind of want to do that a little bit but you also want to scale back so that people can like understand them. if they look at the ingredients you're like oh this is a margarita but just different shit inside of it you know or something yeah so. of course and it's all about how you you know word the the ingredients on the menus as well too right like placing like the big brand name right at the front and then like what's the next most important ingredient like yeah sure maybe the second like most quantity wise is sherry in that cocktail but I'm going to slide that further back in the menu description because people like coconut way mm-hmm. better. Mm-hmm. And that's going to be the second word. And like, how do I catch people right. into getting excited about these menus as I'm designing it? Yeah, I try to put the syrups last just because at least here in Dubuque, people just like, oh, I don't want it to be so sweet. I'm like, well, that's why it's last to represent that it is. Which is wild because everything you order is really sweet. <laughs> what do you mean? Yeah. Like well, everything you have to have Dubuque's sugar. order is oh, it's yeah. like sweet shit yeah brandy old fashioned yeah this town a lot of a lot of places make really sweet cocktails and i get that's why they're saying that but i'm like eh, you know i know how to balance (laughs) you have to have sugar though in some quantity Mm -hmm. whether it's even a spirit forward drink still has sugar in the alcohol Mm -hmm. like it has to be balanced right yeah like if i didn't put sugar in this it would be really bad and then you complain that you had a shitty drink right but then then after the you know once they have one they're like oh you do know what you're talking about i'm like look (laughs) <laughs> no i'm just kidding i don't say that well kind of sometimes you have you have said it that exact thing <laughs> you can have an internal monologue yeah. <laughs> nothing wrong with that. yeah so when you did that like okay so then you did that and then i know billy was saying like it's just a waiting game right like you submit that and you have to wait six to eight weeks i think he said or something it was is a while it- it feels like longer right. <laughs> it's an eternity you know to, to hear back because at that point i mean they're going from 100 to 30, you really have a one in three chance mm-hmm. of kind of getting in. So your odds are better than initially submitting. So how many people, you're competing amongst your peers? How many people did they tell you how many people submitted just the first recipe, you know, to get into the top 100? Yeah, they did. But I, I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, they told us whenever we were like, actually there in Denver, Colorado, about how many people applied and right. we were the top 30. But I can't remember for the life of me. It, it was a thousands number, 
It wasn't <laughs> a tens of thousands, but it was a thousands. It was a four <laughs> four digit number. Yeah, I mean, because then yeah, yeah, because you like you said, the, the odds of that just getting the top hundred are way harder than just getting the yeah. top thirty. Well, and the really cool thing about this competition is too, it doesn't. You don't just have to be a bartender to be able to apply. You could just be a restaurant owner. You could be a spirit enthusiast, mm-hmm. right? There's there are no restrictions. You don't have to work in a hospitality establishment to apply for this. So right. it's kind of wide open, yep. which is kind of neat too. Isn't this the year though? Don't you have to be in the hospitality industry this year? Cause I, someone said that that's a major rule change this year over last year. I have not looked at my toolkit yet uh, yeah. for the challenge to <laughs> dig in uh, again, something about having a small child right. uh, just kind of <laughs> slowed me down. No, yeah. There's still plenty of time. So yeah, there's some Instagram group I'm in where this guy, he was in the top 30 last year and i met him when i was at uh brooklyn we sat next to each other at clover club and so he has an instagram account where he just sends bar bar competition links and he and that was the one thing he said he's like this year's competition is different because you have to be in the hospitality industry you have to you can be a bar back but as long as you got to work in, in the hospitality industry then, i think so. that's great i mean they listen to feedback from the people that compete right. and so every year the competition gets better and better it gets more involved you know more intensive because they listen. Not many competitions listen to what mm-hmm. the competitors have to say. Oh, and I trust think that me, that's I know. one thing that USBG, like yeah. Diageo World Class, that's, that's what they do best. Yeah, absolutely. Because it would be weird, right, if someone who won, like, the United States and went to compete against everyone else is not a bartender, not, just doesn't work in the hospitality. They're just some Joe Schmo in their basement that just makes cocktails. And, like, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I, I mean... If they had been in the industry, it would make sense. Right. They retired from the industry. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I mean, and part of it, too, is it's a competition. They could be a very eloquent speaker. And, you know, maybe they hit a couple of really great points in their speech because you have to know about the brands. You have to mm-hmm. know about all the ingredients. And if you know all of that and your cocktails may be 70% out of 100, you know. Right. Like, that's true. You can still do pretty well. Yeah. Fuck you, Stephen Keen. You can't apply this year. <laughs> <laughs> but... So, so you get the email. How excited, like, like did they tell you when they were sending the email or did you just one day you get it in your inbox that here's... You just wake up and it's in your inbox. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, if you're like most of us, you don't check your email all the time. <laughs> right. So <laughs> you start waking up to the text messages from your friends or like, you know, like you said, Instagram messages. Did you get a letter? Did you get a letter? And you're like, oh, crap. So now it like starts to like intensify <laughs> because other people are starting to get rejected or <laughs> you know, right. getting their approval letters. And so like it, it heightens a little bit uh, for a while. But I was pretty pumped. I was I was really excited. I was pleasantly surprised. Um this was one that I was really excited about, though, because I had a personal connection to the mm-hmm. menu I designed. I'm a huge nerd. You know that about me. Absolutely. If you listen to my other interview with you or listen to my own podcast. I'm a nerd, and I got to design a comic book menu. Like I was very invested this year. So absolutely, I was pretty excited. No, and that's I, I've I've mentioned this on many podcasts before that the more invested you are around like the theme of your cocktail menu, the more it shows through when you make your cocktails and tell the stories through it because 1000%, it it just has more meaning to you. And then you just see more. If you're excited about it, Uh you can, you can make other people excited about it because your enthusiasm just bleeds out of you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's not like the bullshit story. Like, Oh, my grandma made this pie uh, when I was a kid. And now this cocktail is that pie. Mm -hmm. Right. Cool. Everybody has a story about a family member or somebody close to them and turned it in. Right. Take it to the next step. Absolutely. So you get that email. You're excited, right? But at this time, though, you get the email knowing you're going to go to Denver, which you lived in Denver before. You and I was so pumped. (laughs) Right. You and your partner have you guys both moved there, right? Back in the day. Yeah. And so we moved there from Florida. Yep. And so you get excited to go to that because did she go with you? So she was invited, uh, of course, uh, yeah. to go, but we had to have somebody watch the uh, the little kid because at yeah. that point, I mean, he was only a month old. Yeah, okay. timing timing was not <laughs> their friend. <No. laughs> I can imagine. Yeah. Did you take any? Yeah. Did you take anyone with you? Uh, no, I uh, flew by myself, but yeah. I had an amazing support network in Denver because I lived there for Absolutely. three and a half years. So I got to see so many friends. I had so many people there throughout. Uh, I mailed stuff to a good friend of mine. Shout out to Becky Rose. Uh, <laughs> I sent her a whole bunch of stuff in the mail for like my set pieces and props for a lot of the competitions. Uh, so that was really incredible. Just having people that like I care about, 
that we trust each other. We have great friendship that mm -hmm. goes a long way. Yeah. I guess maybe I moved too forward. So you get the, you get the email saying you're in the top 30 and then there's probably instructions of what the next steps are. What, how did that go about and what were they? And then how did you prepare for what you were going to present in the top 30? Yeah, sure. So like most people, I procrastinated for at least a week or two. Uh, <laughs> because that's what we do in this industry. Standard. It's, you know, like I, I printed it out at work, sat it on my desk. I was like, yeah, I'll get there. You know, you look at it every day. Right. <laughs> and then, uh, then I started to dive in. Um, three challenges. Uh, so there was the Kettle One Community Challenge. Uh, there was the Santa, I'm sorry, uh, the Zacapa Rum uh, House Above the Clouds competition. And then the dreaded speed round, the... Uh, the old challenge that doesn't go away. <laughs> uh, so you have to look at those individually. Each one has a very strict set of parameters that you have to use from in-house ingredients to custom ingredients, to props you can have on the bar, to how your menu is designed. It goes through the whole gambit. Uh, you get a separate rubric for each uh, you know, competition that has breakdown of all the scoring things. You get to see those in advance. Um, and kind of look at like, hey, this would be what happens if you don't do so great. This is like a middle of the road score. So you get to see like the whole thing across it, mm -hmm. uh, which is really, really neat. It's very in-depth. There's like 100 pages in this uh, PDF file that they sent. It's like Jesus. the world-class toolkit. It's very cool. Right. It is very cool. <laughs> um, That's awesome. So we got to dive into that and each one had their own challenge. And I was like, okay, let's just start with the first challenge that really just like jumps at me. Like, what do we do? Because you can't tackle them all at once. Otherwise, you're completely overwhelmed, mm -hmm. right? Because then you're trying to just juggle too many things and you can't do it. Yep. So I was like, okay, we know the speed round is a finite thing. Let's save that for the end. There's nothing you can really do to change the speed round. You know, <laughs> like, right. let's just push that off. So let's look at the uh, the house above the clouds challenge. So I jumped in with Sakapa rum. Uh, basically, the distillery is 7,000 you know, plus feet of, or miles above sea level. And they want you to kind of emulate that being the highest distillery. And I said, cool, let's screw that. Uh, let's go the other direction and we'll go below the water. <laughs> I said, <laughs> every single person in this competition is going to be doing marshmallows, clouds, you know, all these aerated aerosols out of you mm -hmm. know, CO2. They're going to be doing some coffee drips. They're going to do all this stuff. And I was like, nah, screw that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so this is where I get super nerdy. I was like, how do I get that far below sea level? You can't. You can't get 7,000 plus miles below sea level. Like, so I was like, okay, 7, let's feet, do this out. 7,000 feet, not miles, right? Mo miles. Oh, yeah. Yeah, feet. God, my brain today. <laughs> Thank you. It's a miles. Monday. I don't know if anybody knows that listening. We're recording on a Monday. Um, <laughs> and it's a Monday night, so it's been yeah. a day. Um, yeah. So I was like, okay, it's a COPPA 23. Let's go 23. Sure. 23 below. So that makes a little bit more sense. Uh, so I found an old whiskey barrel. I filled it up and basically sunk it <laughs> 23 feet. Didn't go well. It leaked <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> it tasted like crap because there's like pond water. I was like, we can't do this. So how do we, uh, how do we replicate this scientifically? Mm -hmm. So basically what I did was I took the rum, I put it into an empty keg, I pressurized it to the appropriate amount. Then I got one of those empty kegs. So I dumped it into the empty keg and put it in my bathtub with like three sous vides running at the same time to oh, wow. replicate the motion on the ocean. Yep. And so this barrel is constantly turning for like basically under that pressure. And uh, for that many days, like rotating in the tub, it got me to like basically the same amount of time of the Solaris system uh, with Zacapa as well, which is like really, really cool. Holy fuck. Was, that's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I went, I went full on and then i of course when you do the competition live you only have like eight minutes to explain all that so here we go <laughs> right so that was my first one i was like you know what let's do it and then to top it all off um i actually bought an antique diver's helmet and made it into a custom smoker and i smoked the cocktail inside of the antique smoker uh using guatemalan driftwood that's awesome so what was what was the <laughs> what was the cocktail itself then yeah uh it was just a really cool uh old-fashioned yep. uh variation with a little like uh basically coconut uh coconut sugar because i wanted to like keep all the ingredients local to like guatemala so i had some coconut sugar in there uh, a little bit of saline solution uh we did some some kombu like seaweed in there to replicate kind of like the ocean aging you know process mm -hmm. it was just a nice well-rounded old-fashioned like drinks don't have to be crazy but they do have to be good right so no one's gonna hear this it's just between the three of us 
was yeah, all and that, and everybody listening to the podcast <laughs> was the doing all of that. Like, did you did you try this drink with the rum right out of a right out of a bottle, and then try to you know side by side to see what the different like what the differences are and what it was? Yeah, of course I did that. Um, I also got like those barrel staves, <laughs> like the ones that you can just like drop in to to add additional aging, mm-hmm. and so like part of the scientific process i soaked those in salt water to kind of like see and then put that into it as a copper bottle and i was like okay i have these couple different variations of how this spirit should taste yeah let's kind of find the best one and see how it makes sense as a drink not just by itself right so it did it, it did add that much more complexity to it than that you were happy with yeah i mean salt does that for anything right whenever right. we're cooking when we're in drinks it's going to pull out certain flavors mm-hmm. but there is that tipping point when you have too much which right. i certainly mm-hmm. experienced <laughs> through the scientific <laughs> process it's like mm, nope that's a ruined bottle next one <laughs> a, ruined, <laughs> a ruined bottle yeah it's like ugh. <laughs> that's too salty <laughs> pass so then, uh, but we used all that for like uh, cooking and stuff in the restaurant. So it was all sustainable. It just wasn't good for drinking. <laughs> right, right. That's cool. Then what did you go to Avaca? Did you go to Kettle One next after that? Yeah, I went to Kettle One. Um, and so it was Community Hero. And they want you to think like, this is a really abstract thing about this because you want to be humble. You don't want to be a braggart in front of this and like talk about how you're a hero. You know, <laughs> right. like the world can't exist without you. That's <laughs> that's ridiculous. Right. So you have to like you have to find a way to weave your story into this cocktail um that you have to create. So I was like, okay, what's my community? Right? Is it going to be the town that I live in? Is it going to be, you know, maybe my work community or maybe somewhere where I do charity work? Like what does that make up? And this is where I actually leaned all the way into the Dungeons and Dragons part of my podcast, uh, which I thought was really great uh, to talk about Community Hero. Because at Bard Tenders, we bring on bards from all around the country, basically hospitality professionals that are doing something else, whether it's a hobby, a side hustle, making pottery, doing amazing artwork, uh, selling like customized lighters and things like that. And so that's that's our community. And one of the big things we do at Bard Tenders is that we advertise for these people 100% for free. We advocate for them. We help connect them with people around the country to help them sell their goods, network, learn, mm-hmm. find mentorships. And so that was the community. And I chose to label myself as the hero for that because I got to just do what we love doing, which is hospitality. Right. And so I had to make a cocktail uh, based around that. <laughs> <laughs> Like me, would just be like, all right, here's bourbon on the rocks. This is what that means, you know? <laughs> yeah, especially when it's kettle one. That's going to go really well. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but yeah, so uh, one of the organizations we work with, uh, Many Worlds Tavern, um, they're one of our sponsors. Uh, we do some cool uh, projects with them. We make some really great drinks. Uh, they do 1% of all of their proceeds from the teas and coffees that they sell yep. to other charities and nonprofits. So I wanted to use their ingredients because we have this basically common thread. Mm-hmm. And so I used a couple of their teas to make different syrups. I had a lapsang tea and I had a coconut tea that went into this one with kettle. So it was this really nice, like swizzled cocktail using tea ingredients, a little bit of lemon and sherry and a super light, bright, tropical style cocktail. Nice. That sounds good. Mm-hmm. And then the most funnest, bestest competition, the speed round. Yeah, which is terrifying Uh, because how many times in the well do you make hundreds of drinks, if not a thousand drinks in a night and you don't sweat once? I mean, you sweat because you're tired, but you don't like you're like, whatever, bring on the drinks. Like, let's go. Let's Mm -hmm. make cocktails. Absolutely. I can do this. Yeah, we can do this. It's not a problem. Uh, But as soon as you're in front of some of the world's best bartenders and hospitality professionals, and then there's a timer and then there's cameras and video (laughs) like feed going And everyone's like chanting, there's music playing. You're like, okay, this is a lot harder than you think because you need to be technically sound. You need to be efficient. And then you also have to tell basically your story because it's really awkward to just be completely silent making drinks for people. Like you have to have something to say while you do it. Right. So all of that being said, (laughs) uh, I got some really good advice. Uh, Somebody said, listen, Stick with something that you know as the theme for your menu. Something that you know better than anybody else. They can't question you on it. It's airtight. Like, Mm -hmm. this is something that's super sound. So that way they can't throw you off your game. You've got this. 
Uh, and then just design some drinks. And the drinks don't have to be crazy. They could just be an old fashioned. Like not every single drink has to be like a signature cocktail. Because this is more I of, did this is more I did that, I'm an idiot. Right. <laughs> this is more of just designing a menu than it was designing signature cocktails for this round, correct? Correct. And that's what I misread <laughs> in the toolkit. Read your hundred plus page toolkit. It's very <laughs> important. Uh because every single one of my drinks was a signature drink that I made and I had so many touches on every cocktail because yeah. <laughs> you know like oops <laughs> they all shared ingredients it was a very intelligently designed menu you know like I'm only picking up one bottle for three drinks etc cetera, etc cetera, right mm -hmm. uh but yeah I did signature drinks for that and then once you made your uh your drinks they gave you a random uh card you drew yep. or uh, just a classic cocktail that you had to make with one of their spirits what was uh what was your random drink uh, it was just a highball nice so super super easy like i'm not getting crazy right. uh johnny blue a little bit of ginger syrup soda water send yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> the little johnny like, blue <laughs> the yeah. most expensive yeah, like, what spirit do you want Here what you spirit do you want for your highball i was like johnny blue obviously yeah. <laughs> like, the, the person like running behind the scenes she was like of course you chose that <laughs> here you go 60 dollars. thank you come again <laughs> <laughs> But it was a very good highball. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it has to be right. It's Johnny Blue. All right. I remember there was a time uh, at the steakhouse place I was working at, and again, I'm still pretty fresh, like a couple years. But I would bartend these private events downstairs, like 40 people, and when it was open tap, people just order the most expensive shit. You know, obviously, this one guy goes, "Can I get Johnny Green and Coke?" And I knew he wanted it together, right? but I poured them separately <laughs> and handed it to him. And he goes, no, I want it together. I go, oh, I legally can't put those two together if you want to. And he's like, really? <laughs> That's blasphemy. <laughs> yeah. And then his friend's like, he's just joking with you, but just, you know, but whatever. It he's was... saying you're ruining it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh. But whatever. So, so I know what, how did that eight minutes go for you? Right. Cause it's eight minutes. Like did. Yeah. I mean, Walk so, us through like what you were thinking the uh, and whatnot. Yeah, of course. So I did a Dungeons and Dragons themed menu. There you because go. What do I know? <laughs> right. I know that. So uh kind of like how I designed my comic book menu, I took a lot of those drinks and moved them over because I already know those. Right. I'm not gonna stress myself out learning all these new drinks. So I basically copy pasted, dropped that in. We're off to the races. Um so I basically designed my menu so that it started with like a non-alcoholic drink, moved into low ABV, flowed through uh, kind of the same way. Like I described it as you're starting a Dungeons and Dragons adventure. You start at a very low level. You work your way up on the there alcohol proof and you kind of go through and you talk about the journey. And of course, like basically it's like hometown hero for the mm. first drink because you're the guy, you know, again, like, it right. kind of moves through like all the stages uh, through there. And I told that story did pretty good, um, did pretty well. Uh, I made my music, the Lord of the Rings, because you're allowed to choose your own music. Yep. Uh, so for the eight minutes, so I actually timed it where, I don't know if you're, you're a fan of Lord of the Rings or have seen the movies, uh, but in the first one, the Fellowship, there's when like the uruk are coming and it plays that super dramatic fight music. Mm -hmm. I actually had that play at exactly two and a half minutes left. So that yep. way I could start moving faster <laughs> and get my <laughs> drinks moving because it was kind of like a cue for me yep. uh, sound wise, which was really great. Um, but it was nerve wracking. It was absolutely nerve wracking. Like you, you think that that is an eternity to make five cocktails. Mm -hmm. It is certainly not whenever you're paying attention to garnishes and like <laughs> intention with every single thing. Yep. I will say this, that the idea of picking certain songs to stop or play at certain points, because I've done that before I've done certain songs. Okay. Once this song starts, I have two minutes left. And I need to start fucking piling through. I need to move. Yep. I need to move because, and and it's that's kind of like a, a sneaky trick, I think, that some people don't even think about. They just want this three songs, party songs, or whatever songs you go. It's like, well, if you fucking edit it just a little bit and bring it down or do something to yep. where you can hear it, you know, but it's, that, it's, a good, the, it's a good tip for sure, I think. And one of the big things for me is it needs to be music that I don't normally listen to. Right. So I'm hyper fixated on it. Cause I worked yeah. in college bars for years. If I'm playing party music, I just tune it out and it disappears. Right. Like I'm, I'm never going to hear that because mm -hmm. I just don't anymore. So it had to be something that was just off putting to me for my normal everyday life kind of yeah. thing to like, to catch me. Yeah. There was uh, a couple years ago, 
when I think I won the second time, I, uh, Templeton Rye was one of the liquors that we had to use. And there's a artist named Greaves. He's a hip hop artist out of Seattle, I think, out of Seattle, right? Mm-hmm. And he, one of his songs, he talks about Templeton Rye. And I just remember I played that song because to me, no one else knows that that reference point in there. And because none of the judges are listening to it, but I, I yeah. knew I picked that song because it timed it perfectly, though, too. But yeah, like you said, if you play music that you always listen to, you're going to tune in and not pay attention. But so did you have any flukes or mess ups or any? Yeah, absolutely. Of yeah. course I did. Of course I, I spent did. like. Whenever I design cocktails, I like to do my garnishes first. That way, when all the drinks finish at the same time, all the garnishes go on. I send out my cocktails, right? Yep. Nice and easy. I could not, for the life of me, get my cucumber ribbon peeled off of the <sighs> cucumber. Like, I could not figure out. And I spent, like, maybe 30, 40 seconds, like, trying to figure this out. Right. And I was like, you know what? Forget that. Uh, right. <laughs> because I've already wasted basically one of my eight minutes, right. like, you know, trying to figure out a garnish. And I haven't touched a liquor bottle yet. Like this, we got to go. So that was definitely an oops on my end. Um, and then things that you don't think about because you're you're so focused on telling a story and talking about the brands and making drinks like cracked egg whites, forgot to wash my hands after I touched the egg whites, right? So you like, you lose a point there, you know, mm-hmm. like little things like that along the way. Um, didn't have any spills or anything like that. All my liquids got in the cups and, you know, whatnot. But like, I'll never forget to, you know, wash my hands after an egg white you know right. drink and then also like maybe the garnishes aren't that important if it's more important to put liquids in cups right absolutely shit there was gonna be a what the fuck was i gonna ask i had this amazing question lined up for about this but now i forget what the fuck it was gonna be Ugh. maybe you should start planning and write shit down get the fuck out of here um <laughs> <laughs> oh no Thank you. That was kind of, yes, that kind of, uh, how much practicing did you do for the speed round? Not you know, enough. Not enough. Not, not yeah. enough. Um, so I did, because I had never done the live competition before, mm-hmm. so I didn't really know what to expect walking into it. I had never seen anybody do the speed rounds before. Yeah. And you're also walking into a bar that you've never bartended. Right. In. So like, it's like whatever at this point, you know, <laughs> like, um, so I practiced a little bit, um, but I didn't realize how important my narrative was going to be mm-hmm. until after the first day. And I watched a bunch of people like telling stories or not being able to tell their stories because the pressure got to them or anything in between. And so like I spent that whole first night like in my hotel room, I set an ironing board up in my room, had all these empty bottles. And I like basically made a well in my bathroom using an <laughs> ironing board. I think I practiced for like four hours, like wow. just running drills, telling my story in front of a mirror and like rocking and really got it dialed in. So there you go. So you didn't go out with everyone like Billy said <laughs> you were hung over the next day. Nope. Uh, but I also lived in Denver, so I wasn't missing anything. Like I right. knew I knew all the bars. I was going to see my I stayed an extra two days after to see my friends. You right. know, like I I kind of knew what I was going to be doing in Denver anyway. So I was yep. like, I'm here for the competition. It's not every day I get to do this. Let's focus. Yeah. So you, you know, Billy was saying, too, that you guys were able to see everyone. Like you said, you kind of saw everyone. Some people stumbled. Some people didn't do the best because pressure got to them. When you got done with all three of your rounds, what did you personally think about your performance? And did you think that you were, do you think you're like, oh, man, I actually have a shot at getting into the top 10? I felt good, but I wasn't confident. I was like, you know what? I put everything I had out there. I have no regrets. I don't think I left anything on the table. Like I just, I felt very good and very fulfilled with everything that I did. And I said, at this point, I don't care if I don't make the top 10. I'm just happy that I got to do this and didn't have any like catastrophes that ruined it for me. Right. That's good. I mean, at least you have that too. We're like, you know, I did everything I could. If 10 other people did better than me, good for them. Awesome. Good for them. Right. You know, good for them. So then what they bring guys all together in a room and they and, announce what yeah well, we went what? to a dinner at a bar called nocturne okay. uh, really really cool jazz lounge in denver uh and then after we had finished eating uh they got up on stage and started calling out the top 10 people's names what what number were you two <laughs> oh, <nice. laughs> so there wasn't a whole was lot of very lucky 
Yeah, I mean, to be like number 10, you're like, fuck me, you know? But like, <laughs> yeah, because the more number names they say, the harder it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Did, was it any specific order? Or was it just random? No, nah, they said it was random, and I, I genuinely feel it was random. Right, you know, so for I, sure. I think that was really cool. Yeah. So you get up there, you know, with everyone else, and you guys got the biggest fucking trophies in the world. Like those things are massively huge. They're barrels. Yeah. They are giant gold barrels. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's in my office at work and it's, it's cool. Yeah. <laughs> I'm it's not going to lie. I don't, I don't like bragging. I'm really bad at like accepting compliments, but it's, it's probably the coolest thing I've achieved because I feel like I earned it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's how I feel about my first drink. It's a, it's a crystal, just a crystal little shaker with a, a topper on it you know and, yeah and i'm just like this thing's so heavy and just looks baller and i remember one time i told her to make a cocktail with a shaker she grabbed this I'm like any shaker no. but that one <laughs> no. but yeah i mean that's awesome i mean it just sits here right behind the bar no one ever notices it unless i point it out but i don't point it out to people because it's not that's really not steady you need to fix that <laughs> Thank you. So that's what partners are for. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I would say you, you just talked about how much you care about that shaker. You need to not let it fall over <laughs> off the sh off the shelf. That's four feet high. Right. So did you uh, do like the Stanley Cup and drink out of it or anything? Or no, we <sighs> can't. It it's like a sealed thing. I I would have tried. <laughs> <laughs> so how uh, so how did you ship that back home? Uh, they shipped it for us. They took care of everything for oh. us. Well, that's easy. They, they asked us as we were holding it. They're like, do you want to take this to your hotel room or out drinking with you tonight? Or do you want to give it to us now and we'll mail it? And I said, please mail it. Yeah. <laughs> take that thing out with you drinking. Jesus. It's, it's my carry on. All right. <laughs> on the way yeah. Back. Yeah. All right. So your pump, your adrenaline's probably super high. How do you even, because it's the next day. Next morning. Next morning is right back into it. How, how do you take that like adrenaline that that i mean i'm not gonna speak for what feelings you had but i'm just assuming that rush, that rush of like holy fuck i made it to the top 10 obviously you called your partner super excited you call other friends probably but how do you get to bed knowing that okay now i gotta shit now i got more to do. yeah yes keep it so the cool thing was that they didn't tell us what the challenges were right away. We weren't okay. going to find out until the next morning at 9 a.m. when we sat down all together and did the unveil of like our new toolkit, like another like 30 pages or so of like the next two challenges. So because I didn't have time to stress out, I didn't have time to plan anything. I had a drink and went to bed. Like I was like, whatever. At this point, everyone's on an even playing field. There's right. nothing you can come into this competition with. There's no ingredients from home allowed. There's nothing like we are literally just going into this all 10 at the same place. Yep. It's anyone's game. And then, so you wake up, you get to wherever you need to go. And what was the, how, what was like the process? The process. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Good. Thank yeah, you. of course. <laughs> um, so when we, First got like our photos taken and everything of like being the top 10. They gave us all a random envelope of who was competing, when, where, everything the next day. So you could kind of like at least mentally prepare mm -hmm. uh, for that. And of course, I drew number one. Uh, so that was cool. <laughs> <laughs> Which I, I kind of like going first because then I get it out of the way and like I don't have like stress all day. Right. You're not um, sitting there just like dwelling on it like, oh, fuck. No. So I was going first for the, uh, the Johnny Walker uh, competition. Uh, so I get into the, uh, the room at nine o'clock. Uh, we walk into this gorgeous prep room that they have basically stationed for us with every bar tool, every piece of equipment, anything you could ever need. They provided for it. Like it was incredible. Nice. Uh, so we walk in at 9am, uh, on our station, there's a toolkit for us. It's flipped upside down and they say, okay, flip it over. Let's go. And they start explaining the challenge to us step by step. And then we could ask questions at the end of each challenge. Okay. And then what was that about? Like, or yeah. So, um, the Johnny Walker challenge, uh, basically we had to get a random, uh, basically flavor category from the Johnny Walker, whether that's fresh or anything else. I obviously got fresh, uh, but it was like the big descriptors for what the actual spirit is. Mm -hmm. Uh, you had 30 minutes to prep a custom ingredient and then you had to go out in front of the judges and tell a story about 
how your basically flavor profile describes the cocktail that you're making and explain how the custom home ingredient that you made fits that also like that descriptor also. And so you you basically have like 30, 40 minutes by the time you go on in front of the judge to have everything ready to rock. Wow. That's not a lot of time. Yeah. And I mean, you can do research and right. prepare for like certain things, mm-hmm. but you still don't know what the challenge is going to be. Like the more you do this competition, the more you learn about each of the Diageo brands mm-hmm. and can kind of start to put together like, okay, this is what Johnny Walker is about. Okay. Right. This is what Don Julio is about. And you can, you can start to put all those pieces. So, cause it's, it's a brand thing for them. Yep. Absolutely. What, what did you end up doing for that? So I got fresh. Um, and I decided that I was going to make a dessert cocktail because screw it. Everyone else is going to make exactly what their descriptor is. I'm not going to do that because right. it worked so well for me with the kappa. I might as well just double down and see what happens. Right. Um, so I made a salted orange zest cordial. I had some fresh, uh, heavy cream. Basically uh, I had Johnny Walker and one other ingredient, which is eluding me. I can't remember off the top of my head. Yeah. Um, basically four things um to make this like dessert style cocktail and as i was telling my story i talked about the importance of fresh ingredients the same way johnny walker uses all these fresh ingredients this cocktail that i'm making for you today is based off of fresh ingredients from my journey as i keep on walking because that's the big johnny walker slogan yeah like slogan and go through it and so you know i talked about you know growing up in pennsylvania and there was you know fresh dairy farms from the amish right down the road so there's the heavy cream for you and then i moved to florida and i have you know the oranges fresh citrus everywhere and i live in saint augustine on the beach so i have this salty like fresh Mm -hmm. air so you get all of that you know then you bring in johnny walker and how the original guy owned a grocery store had all these fresh ingredients blah 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 you know you get the story not (laughs) not to detract but it was really really cool to create that cocktail um and that was one that I was really proud of because Charles Jolie came up to me afterwards. I was like, hey, you had the best cocktail of the entire day for Johnny Walker. It was absolutely incredible. And I got my judges feedback and I was like top 25 in all of them. And I was like, this is awesome. Like, nice. And he's like, everybody else made what we expected and you didn't. That was cool. Yep. That's awesome. Go yeah. with your gut. Just go with your gut. Right. You know? Yeah, because something it's just too easy to go this easy way out on everything. It's just like, man, like you said even earlier, like you started off your whole competition just doing things completely different. And I think that's that shows creativity for sure. And not just you're not going for the layup. You're going for that, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. long shot. Yeah. yeah. So after your okay, case, so then after that, what was your next competition? Uh, then we had a food pairing. Uh, so you literally just walked behind the bar. Uh, you were presented a plate of food. They lifted the cover. You got to taste it, try it. You had 10 minutes to prep a, prep a drink, write down all your recipe things. Then you jump behind the bar and had to make a cocktail that paired with that food. No planning. <laughs> what was the food? Uh, so for me, it was uh, prosciutto uh, wrapped around uh, honeydew melon. So what did you end up making for that? Because well, I'm allergic to honeydew, so I couldn't oh, even try no. that food. <laughs> but um, I made like a low ABV, uh, basically split base sherry spritz because bubbles cut through the fat. You have a little bit of sherry there that pairs really well with the the fattiness of the meat. Uh, and then of course you have like citrus to tie into the melon, and you have these beautiful flavors in the seed lip products that really accentuate garden flavors like fresh honeydew and things like that. So it was pretty good. Um, it was a lot of fun. It yeah. was a lot of fun. It was definitely uh, really neat to like have a challenge like that on the fly at that level. Yeah. I mean, that because that's definitely showing because everyone can pair wine and food together. But I've always been adamant about trying to pair beer and cocktails with food because it's so different. And because you have there's more there's other possibilities that you can do with a cocktail or a, with a beer, especially cocktails, because you can add your own greens to subtly yeah. pair with the different like back profiles and stuff like that so it's just unfortunate oh, yeah. you got <laughs> something you <laughs> couldn't even you <laughs> hey sometimes that's the luck of the draw you know right it's cool yep exactly. we're hospitality professionals we got this we roll with it yep so was that was that just those two competent those two then yep and then after that um we kind of all dispersed for a little bit freshened up went to dinner and then went to the live rooftop presentation to see who wins nice and how did that go? Did they did they just announce the winner? Did they kind of tell what like the top two or top three were? 
Yeah, of course. So they announced the winners of the individual challenges from the first round. So that way all of the top 30 had a chance at winning something like this. Because you def- you could win the Kettle 1 challenge, okay. but not make the top 10, right? It just, right. It's all variable. So they announced the individual winners. Uh, then they announced the winner of the Bartender's Bartender uh, new element. So basically all of the competitors voted on who they thought was like the Bartender's Bartender. Uh, right. So that was really cool to see. Uh, and then um, they announced uh, the winner, which I had a huge panic attack because I share the same first name as the winner. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a solid like second and a half where I almost shit my pants. <laughs> you were th- you were a last name off. <laughs> yep. Yep. I at least got the first eight letters in there. Right. So that was. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I mean, you know. I think making the top 10 is something that you're obviously going to cherish for the rest of your life, right? I mean, that's got to be an experience yeah. and have to be hard to yeah. ever top unless you win, <laughs> you know? Yeah. But so what? I'm very happy with what I did. You know, if I yeah. never compete again, cool. Like I I feel very, very satisfied with everything. And I, yeah. I think that that's what's cool. Like we've done so many of these competitions over the year. I know you have for sure as well. Mm-hmm. Like sometimes you're like, you know, like that kind of stinks or no, I felt good the whole way through. So yeah. that was that was really cool to experience. Mm. So what else? I know we asked, or you asked, what did you ask um, Billy last time? Oh, like just top three good and bad things that you took out of either your your own performance or just from the competition in general. Top like three, three good things, or bad? Yeah, like three things that were great and three things that you learned from. Yeah, of course. Uh, so one, I really loved that, like it, I truly feel like this competition does bring the best of the best to this. It's not Mm -hmm. like these local competitions where sometimes it's a, a favoritism type thing Mm -hmm. or nepotism or anything like that. It truly brings the best of the best and puts them, you know, in situations where they can grow and learn and, you know, network with each other. That's really cool. Like every single person. 1 million percent deserves to be in that room and on that stage. And that's really cool because that doesn't happen all the time. So I think that was a really, really unique thing that I, you, you can't, you can't replicate that outside of that competition. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely a positive takeaway there. Um, I definitely learned, uh, that I, I trust my gut, go with it. Like that was definitely a big thing for me. Like having done it, you know, to make it to the top 10 and then also just do it, you know, through the, the Johnny Walker challenge, like, just trust yourself. You've been doing this long enough. You know, you're a professional in this, like just go with your first instinct. It's probably going to be right. And so yep. that was really cool. Like as a, as a learning moment for me, like, cool. I, I did that. <laughs> that was neat. Um, and then uh, three, uh, probably trust the process. Like okay. everything is done with intent. Pay attention to everything that's going on along the way. And you'll do just fine. You can do that in any aspect of your life. Right. right. <laughs> like, Pay attention to the details. Yep, absolutely. Cool. Read those hundred pages. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And Trust the process, them. man. You're gonna get there at the end of the journey. <laughs> the more we talk about, the more we talk to people who competed and got into the top thirty, mm-hmm. the more I realize, oh shit, Carl would definitely struggle. <laughs> not because you're not a great bartender or mixologist, but because you. All of the things that John has mentioned today, <laughs> you suck at <laughs> <laughs> reading a hundred pages. You fuck it. I'll just figure it out. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna scan it into Chat GPT and give, tell Chat GPT to give me the fucking re- run to note. clip note this bitch. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Amazing. You know what? Fuck you. I'm going to prove you wrong. Okay. <laughs> do it. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> if you take anything from this, do it. <laughs> Fucking be intentional and like spend, take your time. I don't have time for that. Right. <laughs> that's that's a long running joke with the entire time Carl and I have been together, which is 10 years now. Uh, anytime he does something, it's... I'm like, hey, maybe you should slow down, do this or do something a little bit. Think about it a little bit more. I don't have time for that. I'm just going to send it. <laughs> I will say this. And here we are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I will say this, though. Now that I'm a business owner, 
there are times where You're I'm, learning I'm back in that it. kitchen and I'm just, and I'm letting frustrations and stuff make like making charcuterie and hummus pies. I'm trying to go super fast. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, Dude, just fucking breathe. It's fucking fine. Just take 20 seconds. Right. Slow the fuck down. Because taking that 20 seconds right now mm-hmm. that you don't have time for mm-hmm. creates less shit that mm-hmm. you don't have time for later. Yeah. Now I, I just got to figure the, out. Uh, I did the cocktail apprentice program last year at Tales of the Cocktail, which is a really great program. People should apply for that as well. That's a, the, the, red of, coat, the red coat program or whatever. Yeah, it was incredible. Um, one of their pieces of advice is work slow to work fast. And that has stuck with me. Like since I heard that, I was like, God, that makes so much sense. Right. Take it slow and eventually you'll get the job done. You will get there, but don't rush the first couple steps because then everything after that goes to shit. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's definitely one of those things too. When I was training my other bartenders at the Riverboat Lounge, I'm like, you guys are going to see me make drinks so fast once we're in the weeds that you're going to want to try to catch up and please do not try to work at my pace. This is nope. me been doing this for many, many years and I can build six drinks at one time. You just work on building two drinks at one time. Like don't yeah. try to keep up with me because it's not going to be right. You're going to, you're going to remake these drinks over and over and over again. It's not going to be fun. You have to. I mean, but, you have to do what? Something 10,000 times to master it. I've at least made 10,000 vodka sodas. So I got that one. <laughs> <laughs> Hence the name vodka pays my bills. <laughs> I did that on purpose. No, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So what is there? Uh, anything negative is not the right word, right? Because the whole experience is definitely fun and learning. It but depends on your outlook. That's true. Like if if you go into it, just wanting to do the thing and being proud of yourself for doing the thing then you're not going to you're not going to come away with like a negative mindset right yeah i really truly i don't have anything negative to say and i would be very honest about that sure absolutely. Uh, i i felt like i came away from everything in a very positive mentality from the competition from start to finish and i think that that's really cool too like i said alluded to earlier not every competition is like that sometimes i do get a little frustrated by like the process for this nope everything is spelled out very clearly (laughs) you know like they're very communicative the whole way through they take care of us they paid for our flights in our hotel like Mm -hmm. the brand is there for you which is really great you know like the people there are incredible they're so kind they're so polite like you just get to do some really cool stuff like i don't have negatives no that's i think the only negative i have is i wanted more time in denver like you know right (laughs) yeah well, and I know Billy said one of the one of his negatives was just putting Amaro Nonino into his oh, yeah. mojito in the speed round, right. which that yeah, I mean that can make sense. That makes sense. Like it's a small thing, and it's not like gonna kill your experience, but it's something that oh hey, I need to work on better next time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I talk about this a lot too. Like it's failing forward, right? right? Like it doesn't have to be a negative if you fail somewhere. You're learning from that experience. I guarantee you, he'll never put Amaro Nonino in a mojito in a speed <laughs> round. Ever no. again, right? right. <laughs> unless, unless that's a drink he makes. Right. right. He okay, comes back well, next year and he that's makes what like I would do because yeah, that's yeah. awesome. <laughs> that's, that's, that's sick. Yeah. You call you like you call that you call that a, like uh, a no hito. No <laughs> <laughs> no like, like, like re- revenge or like right. revenge is like a drink best served shake it. I don't know. Like, right. Yeah. yeah. Whatever. <laughs> Something. So that, yeah, I hope that I hope he does make it that far and, pl- and like leans the fuck into something like that. Right. But, you know. Oh, yeah. But how I mean, I guess one thing I asked him, too, was how many people did you already know in the top 30? Like, did you know anyone else besides yourself, I guess, going into there or, or was well, it new experiences? I knew of yeah. a lot of them. You know, because, you know, this is a really, really small world. Like, that yeah, we live in. the more you do and the more connected you are. The smaller it is. Um, mm-hmm. So I knew of people, a lot of friends of friends. Sure. Um, but no one that I knew, like, explicitly going into the competition. Right. Which I think was also kind of neat, too, because I got to meet so many cool people. Right. And now you have 29 new interviewees for your podcast. <laughs> yeah, we already have one on the show. Uh, shout out to Ingrid. <laughs> she nice. hopped on. Uh, but, yeah, uh, that's the cool thing. And truly, I haven't said it yet, but, you know, Jonathan is going to China very, very soon. And he's mm-hmm. going to crush it like that's awesome he is a fantastic representative of everybody who did world class in 2024 and so excited for him to do great things there yeah i couldn't imagine like what that would feel like knowing like fuck i gotta fly halfway across the world and be on point 
and do my game, you know, but it's hard. Yeah. I couldn't imagine, but yeah, I don't know. When, when does he go for there soon? You said, Oh, so soon. It's like weeks, if not less. Yeah. I oh, can what? check the socials. I mean, yeah. Joe Joe's posting his cocktail. Uh, when is this episode coming out? This Friday. Cool. So anybody listening to this uh, on his Instagram, on social media, the bitter gringo, uh, he has a link that's up online. Click that link because yep. they get points for whatever their first round competition is over in Shanghai. There you and go. So the more views their website has, the better he does. So if you're a U.S. bartender and you're listening to this, give that man some love because we got to get him to the next round. <laughs> Absolutely. One the question I was going to ask you, because you were talking about your R&D how much money do you think you spent R and D to get to your top thirty? Not get to the. I'm sorry, not get to the top thirty, but to get your menu where you wanted it to be to take it to the top thirty. Yes, the stuff that you so, flew out and did all that. I am an outlier. I am very lucky to have a very supportive company that loves when I do these things, mm-hmm. and they help take care of all of that along the way. Um, there you go. A lot of the equipment and tools I use for golf tournaments as set pieces on bars. So a lot of that was already in in stock in the shop, you know, and Mm -hmm. a lot of the ingredients Diageo brands provided for us. So like, really, I, I didn't. And I know that that's very rare. And I'm very grateful for that opportunity, because a lot of times it does involve lots of dollars. It I we the last two years I won, I basically broke even because both for for the Iowa contest for the Iowa contest. Yes. Um, because one year we were representing ourselves, we were representing Alchemix bar. And so that was 100% on us. And then the only thing I got the hotel to pay for was some of the liquor. Uh, they did, they paid for the liquor at the competition, but all the R and D mm-hmm. we paid for ourselves. And, you know, I won a thousand dollars. I'm like, sweet. I made a hundred dollars profit, you know, or so, like, yeah. it's just like, and, and that's the dark side of competitions. Mm-hmm. We could go down a rabbit hole talking about that for the next hour. Man. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. There's a lot of that that happens behind the scenes. Mm, um, right. But like I said, I'm just, I'm very fortunate and very grateful for the circumstances that I had going yep. into it this year. No, so. for sure. That's awesome. That's one of the small, like, not, that's the small wife things that I have that I'm grateful. Like, listen. <laughs> I don't really want you to spend five thousand dollars R and Ding for this competition. I really don't want you to. I, I want you to compete, and I want and I and I want to support you. But like, man, let's be honest about this industry. <laughs> it's not except it, it. It can be very lucrative, but not that lucrative. We and yeah. just to be clear, <laughs> I did not. I've never spent five k on no, R&D. I heard it. I, I heard it. You spent. So much money, Carl. Yeah. You're you in so have, much though. trouble. Yeah. You, you would have, though. Yeah. Well, and I mean, you probably spent a thousand dollars easily for the Iowa State Fair thing last year. That was just the R and D part, not the actual. Yeah. And but you, I will you'd say, have, you'd have been use, looking for glassware and yeah. <laughs> just all of your shit. Use your tools to your advantage. Yeah. Like If you make it to the top thirty, for anybody out there next year that does. It's great for your bar. It's great advertising. It's great marketing. Like pitch it to them that way. They'll be very supportive. Reach out to your local reps. A lot of times they have sample bottles for you. Heck, even reach out to people like me or Carl that might have a whole bunch of empty bottles sitting on the back bar, half used bottles. I'll mail you something. Right, you know, absolutely. like if you need something, I don't want it in my house. I have too many bottles. And if I ever right, move again, I don't want to pack them. You know, like, yep. <laughs> like I see two bottles of Domain de Canton in your back bar right now. You'll yes. need both of those. Nope, Someone sure can ship that to somebody. You know, <laughs> like, you don't tell me what I need, John. You shut up. You leave him. Yeah, you're right. My bad. I apologize. <laughs> Didn't mean no. to gaslight you there. <laughs> no, but that's, I mean, yeah, it's it, this. People say it all the time on many podcasts and many people we talk to that this cocktail community is more than willing to help you out. And so it is odd trying to reach out to someone you don't know in person through a DM, through Instagram or Facebook and say, hey, I'm doing this thing. I know you did it. Can you help me? Because, like, we know we're all busy. We all have fucking crazy lives and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, they're either going to try to help you the best they can or point you in the direction to someone that can help you or an article 1,000%. or something out there like, I've been through this, read this or watch yeah. this video. Or- I mean, and that just comes down to the nature of 
what the industry is. It's it's hospitality. Mm-hmm. If, right. you, if you don't embrace that as part of just like you, the way that you comport yourself as a person, mm-hmm. then you're not going to do well in the industry in general. No. But you're also going to have a bad time working. Mm-hmm. Agree. Yeah. yeah. And don't gatekeep. If you're out there gatekeeping, stop it. Mm-hmm. Share information. It's 2024. Help people. Yeah. Right. It's not because the information that you're keeping to yourself isn't your information. Yeah, they can find it. Anyways. Yeah. They can find it. But wouldn't it be nicer if you were just nice to other people and helped them find it faster? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like when I tell people, like, I'll give you the recipes on how to build any cocktail I ever make. They're like, really? I go, I don't give a shit, man. Like, it's a drink. Yeah. All I ask for is if you do put it on your own social or something, you just tag me. But I actually don't give a shit if you don't. Like, yeah, it, it's what, these honestly, are they're not going to make a drink the same way we do anyways. Like we right. got our own special touch. It's never going to taste the same way as it was whenever they sat at my bar having that cocktail. Right. I'll right. give exactly. you the recipe. Make it at home on your shitty ice. Let's yeah. go. Right. Or make it at home and have it be less good just because you had to make it yourself. Right. Yeah. Because I've had people come to the bar like, man, this drink doesn't taste the same. I go, it's because I made it for you. Like when you when you come to here, you get the experience of sitting down, talking to me, seeing this, seeing that, seeing John. You know, you're, it's it's something different when you see someone else present it to you than well, you just doing it at home. It's and it's when, when you don't have to make it yourself. Mm-hmm. That's that's a big thing, right? I love to eat the food I cooked, but I don't want to cook, <laughs> <laughs> so it's not as good when I have you to know, cook myself. You know dinner. what nobody tells you over the age of thirty. Is that sometimes after you're done cooking, you just don't want to eat anymore. You just want to go to bed because you're so tired. <laughs> That's a That's secret. <laughs> like, holy cow, no one prepared me for that. It's like, I used to complain to mom, why are we always eating the same five meals? Well, because those took 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, so do you have any advice for anyone that might be competing this year or that might be interested in competing this year? What, what would you tell them? Of course. Uh, First piece of advice is just do it. If you are on the fence about applying or competing, just do it. The worst thing anybody can ever tell you is no. And even when they say no, try again next year. Get after it. Take the advice that you get. Take all that feedback and get after it if it's something you want to do. So that's my first piece of advice. I'd also say, like I said many times, trust your gut. Go Mm -hmm. with it. If something feels good, there's a reason it feels good about why you're creating a drink that way or presenting a recipe that way go with absolutely it. i would also say be intentional read your materials take your time yeah don't be carl yeah no <laughs> don't do me or yeah i mean don't don't be you don't be me <laughs> don't pull at you yeah <laughs> only i can yeah. pull at me do what <laughs> i say not what i do yeah exactly <laughs> awesome well that i mean i'm so i was so happy like I'm, i was so happy to know that two people that we knew went into the top 30 yeah and i remember like when i saw both of you i text you both like hey if you don't know this person go find this person because you both have been on the podcast (laughs) (laughs) and i think you both said oh yeah i remember that episode you know or or whatever (laughs) and so it was fun to to live vicariously through you two and i'm proud of both of you i'm proud of you john and it's so awesome to know that you worked your ass off to get where you are hell yeah thank you of course (laughs) He's like, stop it. I'm uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But, you know. I'm sometimes... waiting to see what I can do to make someone cry. <laughs> Sophie. <Yeah. laughs> no, that's just tiredness. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's exhaustion. Yeah, it's bedtime almost. Did I mention I had a baby? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but. Yeah, oh, I wanted to ask how, like, you. <laughs> the timeline <laughs> is very stressful. <laughs> like. Mm-hmm. If if I was about to give birth and Carl said, I'm going to enter this competition, I'd be like, fuck you. <laughs> How <So> was that? <laughs> I made a promise to my wife because I do a lot of industry things. I go to a lot of conferences, you know, and I I go to, you know, BCB, Tales of the Cocktail and things like that, um, do these competitions. And when my wife got pregnant, I made a promise that I would only apply to world class. That would be the only time I leave. And I got to go. And I haven't done anything else. So, (laughs) (laughs) you know, Uh, but it was threading a needle. It was very nerve wracking. Um, Yeah. I also, because I work for TBC Sawgrass, we have the players that's held there every year. Uh, My wife was nine months pregnant uh, during that golf tournament. And we're like, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh, we could be going to the hospital any minute. But we made it. Uh, (laughs) Just really, really great. 
Um, and you then, see John yeah. running through the 18th hole because he's gonna get a shortcut and go to his fucking yeah. sorry, car. Sorry, Scotty Scheffler. I, go. <laughs> I know you, your wife was pregnant at the time too, Scotty. Like you get this. So. <laughs> um, that would be fucking hilarious. <laughs> Well, there goes John, arrested. Uh, and he, and he, has a, he, has a, he has an old fashioned in his hand while he's driving. He's like, well. It's fine. It's fine. Um, but no, we, we really threaded the needle uh, That's awesome. on that one. So that was pretty cool. That's awesome. Awesome. So go ahead and tell people any socials or anything that you want to plug yourself. Plug yourself. Plug myself. <laughs> <laughs> this is the wrong, this is uh, the wrong podcast for that. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, you can check out me on social media at Vodka Pays My Bills because it does. Uh, mm-hmm. It's a real thing. Uh, I also have a podcast myself uh, that Carl has been on as well. It's called Bard Tenders. Uh, basically, we do interview formats from bartenders all over the world and talk about kind of how they started in the industry and things that they're incredibly passionate about or super knowledgeable about. And we also get nerdy and play D&D, uh, which is a ton of fun. Uh, you can check us out at bard tenders you can check out our website at www.bardtender.com and like do you want to start a tab we love five star reviews so make sure when you leave one for do you want to start a tab you leave one for us too it's a buy one get one everybody right. five stars. <laughs> there we go and we'll leave links for everything we'll leave a link for our better giuseppe right that's that's his ig right no uh better bitter no the bitter gringo so close yeah <laughs> I, I knew that wasn't yeah. right but i could not remember either <laughs> so anything, impo- anything important will be in the description of the podcast you're listening to john we always appreciate it i know you're a busy man with uh work and being a father an infant, an infant having an infant so we appreciate you being on Thanks yeah, for having me this was fantastic it's not awesome. often we get to talk about cool stuff with cool people so right exactly and that's why we do what we do, right? Heck yeah, it is. All right, guys. Just remember, don't be a dick. Tip your bartenders and drink responsibly. <laughs>